The trouble with old model steam engines. Common problems often found when working with badly made models. I'm using this model as an example. Stuart steam engines are a very popular engine. And if they're very well made, they're great. If they're not very well made, they're not so good. This one sort of falls into a midway category. It's actually quite well engineered. And everything fits, but there are one or two problems with it. This is the main problem. It rattles and it's a bit lumpy when it's running. I wonder why that is. This engine was given to me by a friend. It's one that he bought from the auction site that we all know and love. And it was never good. The first thing I did was to fit some silicone rubber piston rings to it. And as you can see when I grip the flywheel, it is quite powerful. But there's more to it than just putting piston rings in an engine. I never like to bodge anything, it's something that's not in my nature. If a job's worth doing, it's worth doing properly. First of all, I will show you the piston ring job that I did. If you look at this clip, there is something wrong with it in my opinion, and I've come across this many times. If an engine is not very good, usually things like the nuts, cylinder head bolts and random parts of the engine are just painted in a different colour. Just as though the man who painted the engine had some paint on his brush and thought, hmm, what can I do with this paint? I really have worked on many engines, and whenever I see nuts and bolts painted in different colours, almost universally, the engine is not going to be good once you get it apart. And I know this makes no sense, and I don't know why it is, but it seems to be a fact. Right, the good news is, none of the bolts are sheared, one of them is a stud, but I can live with that. And here are the pistons. The holes drilled in the top allow a pair of circlip pliers to undo the pistons. They're not drilled in the right place, but such is life. I took these out a while back, fitted some silicone piston rings and put them back in the engine. I'll just pull this piston out of the cylinder to just show an important point. If you pull a piston out of a cylinder and the o-ring is all flattened, all squared off, that means that the o-ring is putting far too much pressure against the cylinder wall. The o-ring, even if it's been run, should remain quite round. You can often get tables showing clearances and tolerances for fitting o-rings from the manufacturers. Or you can look in a Zeus book, that's Z-E-U-S as in the Greek god. A Zeus book is a very useful thing to have in the workshop. The next thing to look at is the flywheel. The flywheel is fixed to the crankshaft with a small grub screw. As I was taking off the flywheel, I noticed a problem. There was quite a lot of movement on the end of the crankshaft, and this is not just due to slop in the bearing. And coincidentally, it's exactly the same problem that I've been having with a Stuart Twin launch that I'm working on. And what is the problem, I hear you all ask? Well, the problem is that this part of the crankshaft is loose in the crank web. So it's time to dismantle the bottom end of the engine, starting by taking off the eccentrics. That's the eccentrics out of the way. Now it's time to take off the big end brasses. Traditionally, these are called brasses, but they're not actually made of brass. They're made from gunmetal. Brass just wouldn't wear well at all. And in order to withdraw the crankshaft, I now need to release the main bearings. The two outer bearings are one-piece gunmetal castings that are bored to suit the crankshaft. The middle one is a split bearing. So just bear with me while I remove the bearings, and then I'll give you a close-up shot. Here they come. That's the second one off. And here we have a pair of outer main bearings for a Stuart 1010V. It's quite unusual to see a pair of main bearings without the traditional oil hole in the middle. The hole in the middle of the centre bearing is not an oil hole, it's where it locates on a peg in the bottom of the bed casting to stop it moving around. And talking about moving around, as you can see this moves around and it's not supposed to. So what am I going to do with this? Generally speaking crankshafts that are like this are not really fixable. I've known about this problem for a while, all the problems I'm outlining I could see before I dismantled the engine. And that's why the engine's just been sat about in the workshop for quite a long time. For the purposes of the video only, I'm going to dismantle this crankshaft and show you a potential repair that is not recommended. I dismantled the crankshaft in the lathe, because I could put a lot of pressure on the crankshaft with the chuck, therefore I wouldn't be scoring it. And when I get it apart, I see that the end is threaded. 
Now this is not a good idea, and once again, as I mentioned earlier, have you noticed that the crankwebs are painted a different colour? Nice pretty little red crankwebs. Although some full-size steam engines have painted crankwebs, it's not a good idea on a small model, because as you can see, most of the paint has been removed. So it's into a bath of cellulose thinners with the crankshaft parts, closely followed by the cylinder covers. I do not like painted cylinder covers. Usually the paint gets very badly chipped. I would only paint a cylinder cover if the metal was either gun metal or brass, which doesn't look right, or if the parts are just really badly machined. I'll find out, of course, when I remove the paint. So once the crankshaft parts have all been depainted, and also degreased by being in the cellulose thinners, the first thing I'm going to do is put a centre hole in the end of the crankshaft so that when it goes back together, it looks like it's been turned between centres, which of course it has not. But it just looks good. Most crankshafts in full-size engines are turned in one piece. And doing it in model sizes is quite difficult, and to be perfectly honest, I've never done that. I'm not that good an engineer that I want to waste the time destroying crankshaft castings or forgings. But at this point, before I get lots of abuse, I would not build a crankshaft like this. This is really horrible. Anyway, as I've said earlier, for the purpose of the video only, I'm putting this back together. It is, of course, vitally important that these cranks are at 90 degrees to each other, and you can do this in the lathe using a couple of set squares. Alternatively, you can, of course, make a jig to do this. Very shortly, I will be making a video about making a crankshaft for the Stuart Twin launch engine that I'm working on. And I must say immediately, it will not be made like this. It will be built up, but built up properly. And still going through the motions, I'm now going to fit a taper pin to pin the crankshaft to the crankwebs. You can, of course, press in a parallel pin. But I just thought I would take this opportunity to show how to use a taper reamer and why you use a taper reamer and how not to break a taper reamer when fitting a taper pin. Be careful how far you go through the hole with a taper reamer because if you go too far through the hole, the taper pin will also go too far through the hole and come out the other side. So as you do this job, try the pin in place frequently. In this demonstration, I'm showing that I need the thicker part of the taper pin to go into the crank web but not the very end of it because it is a little bit too big. Eventually, when the hole is the right size, I'm applying a drop of Loctite 603. Now, for taper pins, you do not need to do this. In fact, you should never do it. But in this small crankshaft, it's a good idea because I don't want it to ever come out. Now, all I need to do is shorten the pin, and I do this by putting it on the bandsaw and cutting the pin at both sides so it's almost flush with the crank web. I'm not going too close to the crankweb because I don't want to mark it with the blade. Once the pin is cut to the correct length to suit the crankweb, I first of all cleaned it up on my one inch belt sander, which is much easier than doing it this way, but I finished it off with some wet or dry sandpaper. So has it worked? Um, well, sort of. It feels a little bit better. One or two of the other junctions are a bit loose. After the part was cleaned up, I put it in my lathe to spin it and see how true it was. And oh look! The part at the right hand side is running really true. The bit that I didn't show was the hitting it with the soft hammer to get it to be true. And if you look at the middle bit, it's anything but true. That's enough about the crankshaft. Now over to other problems with the engine. The gudgeon pin that holds the connecting rod onto the crosshead is a rattle fit. It's horrible. What I'm going to do next is refit the crankshaft with the existing main bearings fit the flywheel and see how freely it turns. And I'm definitely not going to hold my breath on this one. The first thing I notice is that as I tighten down the main bearings, the crankshaft is effectively clamped to the bed plate. And in order to rotate the crankshaft, I had to slacken off all of the bearings. Before refitting the flywheel, I re-threaded the grub screw hole and I put an Allen headed grub screw in there, a 4BA grub screw, which is a lot stronger than the one that was in there. I really do not like grub screws with a single slot in them because what often happens is that half of the screw slot breaks off if you put too much pressure on them. And sometimes the remains of these grub screws can be very difficult to get out. And similarly, when tapping a hole in a thing like this, take it easy. If you break the tap, that is even worse. You will notice that the flywheel is painted in a strange combination of red and black. And once again, anything that is painted like this usually has a problem. 
It's quite useful though really because it gives me advance warning that the engine is not going to be right and also helps me estimate the repair cost accurately. What you're about to see I never recommend and that is using an electric drill on the end of a crankshaft to run it in or to attempt to run it in. So why am I doing it now I hear you all ask. Well I'm doing it now because I'm going to show you what happens if you use an electric power drill on the end of a crankshaft to attempt to run in the engine because the crankshaft is too stiff to turn normally. Remember looking back on the video clip where it showed the crankshaft in the lathe you can clearly see that the centre section of the crankshaft is not true. So before using the electric drill I absolutely flooded the crankshaft area with oil so that it wouldn't seize up. So has the electric drill running in process been successful? Um, no. And once again on this video I repeat the fact that I'm doing this to illustrate how it doesn't work. Bit of a strange thing to do I know. But it's good to watch me doing the repair and finding out that it's no good rather than doing it yourself and finding out that it's no good. This type of repair can be successful on a larger crankshaft but not on crankshafts of this size. So what else is wrong with the engine? The crankshaft is scrap. The thread on the steam inlet manifold, the one that goes into the steam chest, is very sloppy and that's going to need either a lot of thread sealant or some PTFE tape. The pistons seal fine because I put silicone o-rings on them but I would really make new pistons as they both look very different and are very odd sizes. And the threads that locate the crosshead pins on both of the connecting rods are stripped. There's one good thing about the engine, two of the gaskets are quite good, I would reuse these. But for the moment I'm going to tip all the contents of this engine into a plastic container, including the main engine itself, and deposit it securely in my drawer where I put scrap engines. In fact, coincidentally, alongside another scrap double ten that also came from an internet auction site. I really do hope that this video is useful to anyone contemplating buying a model steam engine from an internet auction site. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.